Bestbookbits.com brings you the book summary of your next five moves, Master the Art of Business Strategy by Patrick Bet David. From the creator of Valuetainment, the number one YouTube channel for entrepreneurs, comes a practical and effective guide for thinking more clearly and achieving your most audacious business goals. Both successful entrepreneurs and chess grandmasters have the vision to look at pieces in front of them and anticipate their next five moves. In this book, Patrick Bet David translates his skill into a valuable methodology that applies to high performers at all levels of business. Whether you feel like you've hit a wall, lost your fire, or looking for innovative strategies to take your business to the next level, your next five moves has the answers. You will gain clarity on what you want and who you want to be. Strategy to help you reason in the war room and the boardroom. Growth tactics for good times and bad. Skills for building the right team based on strong values. Insight on power plays and the art of applying leverage. Combining these principles and revelations drawn from Patrick's own rise to successful CEO, your next five moves is a must read for any serious executive, strategist or entrepreneur. On with the book summary, thinking ahead. Most people don't think more than one or two moves ahead. Those people are amateurs and flame out quickly in business. Effective strategy is about making a move and being prepared to launch another series of moves based on how the market or your competition reacts. The simple questions in business are binary. Their answer is either yes or no. The trap is believing that all answers are binary. The answer to any question is actually a series of moves deployed in the proper sequence. As he was growing up, he can tell you how many times his dad said, never be afraid of the truth. It stuck with him, and it instilled the value in his company. He had studied many other organizations and felt that being direct and painfully truthful were important. You need to act like future is here, start at the end. A phrase I use all the time is future truth. It means to live in the present as if your future truth has already become a reality. Did you get that last sentence? You must act like a great company or a great entrepreneur slash intrapreneur long before you've ever become one. Are you following? Let me explain. Envy is a sign. When you're honest about who you are, you learn to stop wanting everything. Envy is an indicator that alerts you if you're being honest with yourself. If you can look at someone who has things you don't and say, you know what, I really don't want that. You know you're in a good place. If you say you don't want something but don't mean it, envy will eat away at you. What if it's telling you that you really do want it, but you're afraid to work for it? Shift odds in your favor. You want to choose a path that puts the odds of winning in your favor. In poker, it's called game selection. What determines if you win a game in any game or business isn't how good you are. It's how good you are relative to your competition. Become an expert processor. Great processors use the words I and see their role in whatever problem has occurred. They ask questions such as, how did I contribute to this? What did I do to co-create this situation? How can I improve so I'll be better equipped to handle something like this in the future? If your new problem shipments were delayed, most people are going to be looking for someone to blame. Remember, though, the great processes look for causes because causes lead to solutions. Expert processes don't fear issues. They welcome them and treat them like a game. If your top sales producer threatens to leave, you start by taking responsibility. This leads you to own the fact that your compensation plan stinks and you have no strategy for retention. Solving for X means isolating your problem. It's not enough to say that your problem is your boss. You need to drill down to determine if it's a lack of autonomy, merit-based pay, or intellectual challenge. You can't solve for your boss. You can solve for a more specific, isolated issue. Your mindset is everything. When you start viewing a crisis as an opportunity, you are winning the game. Don't forget to process your time frame. For instance, if you spend $100,000, you can get something done in six months. But if you spend $200,000, you can finish it in three months. Then you can ask yourself, is it worth spending twice the money to get the project done in half the time? Business operation. Good question for updating operations. With all these steps required, a hands-on method, 
and which can run automatically by technology that we could buy or create. Two common business problems. Number one, offense. The opportunity to make money or advance your business or career. The choice here often revolves around growth, expansion, marketing, and sales. Number two, defense. The opportunity to solve a problem to stop losing money or to stop moving backward in some way. The choices here frequently involve legal matters such as compliance and protection against competitors or market corrections. Hiring and getting the best out of people. Some CEOs make the mistake of thinking that recruiting ends once a person joins the company. The reality is that when you recruit top talent, you have to constantly re-recruit that talent. Some people are motivated by equity, some by profit sharing, some by big salaries, some by bonuses, and still others by long-term security. No two are the same. The key is to create the right type of compensation plan that will attract and retain the kind of talent you're looking for. Plus, just as homeowners treat their homes better than their renters do, once you give people ownership in a company, their mindset shifts. Here's the strategy. Give your key people equity, but don't do so immediately. Let them earn it. Creating your compensation plan. I approach the question the same way a composer or choreographer would. Creating the right compensation plan is like creating the right melody. What makes the Academy Award winning composer Hans Zimmer special is that he knows how to take different tunes and bring them together to work perfectly for an entire movie. Number one, decide what behavior or final result you want to recognize. Number two, study the current compensation structure within your industry. Even if you're going to disrupt the status quo, you first need to know what the status quo is. Number three, find ways to create three times of incentives to strive for. This is much more effective than one all or nothing incentive to compete for. To create your values, let's make a list of values and principles that we want to live by. Let's see how many we can come up with. Examples of Patrick's values. We want to stand for as a family. Lead, because it will be necessary in every situation you face. Respect, because everyone has something to teach you. Improve, because that's how you know everything will work out. Love, because everyone is dealing with a challenging life. Our core values. Courage, not being afraid to challenge others. Wisdom, making the right choices. Tolerance, knowing that you're dealing with human beings who change all the time. Understanding, appreciating and respecting that everyone has different ideas and values. Business systems, make your business independent. The less your business depends on you, the more valuable it is. The more your business depends on you, the less valuable it is. There's no exit opportunity if a business relies on your personality. Media.net founder Divyank Tarakia, a 38-year-old with a net worth of $1.76 billion, once said, keep figuring out how to replace yourself because your time is most valuable in this process. Six strategies for replacement and skill transfer. Number one, list your tasks and skills. Make a list of all your tasks and skills and determine which ones you are the best at and which ones you are not. Focus on your strengths and replace yourself on all the other tasks. Number two, identify who's seasonal and who's not. You can't assume that everyone is going to work with you forever. You need to identify who is there to fill a six-year role and who a six-month role. If you determine that now, you won't be surprised when someone needs to be replaced. Number three, know the different language spoken by your sales, support, technical, and executive teams. Sales leaders generate revenue and build a company through their efforts. Number four, know who can maintain the company culture. It's very important that whoever replaces you will fit the culture you've established so that the business can keep growing after you leave. Number five, Know your company's practices and procedures. You need to put pen to paper and write down each department's practices and procedures. Replacements will have a manual to follow, regardless of their level, making the transfer of specific skills quick and painless. Number six, develop leaders to help spread the right mindset. Having one-on-one -on -one conversations with your future leaders to inject the company's mindset into them now before they need 
to replace someone. Make sure to have formal agreements in place. In business, you go and have relationships with employees, partners, investors, suppliers, and advisors. You might love each and every one of these people, but if you don't have a formal agreement, you're asking for the type of stress and financial loss that comes with the most contentious of divorces. Before agreeing to any major business deal, you want the following to be agreed upon. Number one, liability cap. What's the most we can lose? Number two, indemnification. You can't sue me. Number three, finite term. Once it's over, it's over. Be positive about people when they aren't there. Make saying positive things behind your teammates back a habit, not just a once a year behavior. If you don't do it, your workplace will lack the friction that produces creative problem solving and positive peer pressure. Don't leave friction to chance. Create a culture in which you spread good words about people. The four areas of linear and exponential growth. Linear. Number one, operating systems. This is about tightening up your systems, technology and processes, making them more efficient and effective. To most entrepreneurs, this is the least exciting part of business. Number two, biz dev and sales. Next to business development, biz dev and sales. This has to do with creating relationships with new vendors and new partnerships and making your sales process better. It's about networking and attending events from your industry. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Exponential. Three, the next innovative campaign. As CEO, you may launch a program or promotion that is potentially game-changing. Making the right move can create a massive surge in your business. You have to synthesize everything you know about your customers' wants and needs, your competition's limitations, and your own strengths to create a campaign that will drive rapid revenue growth. Number four, leadership development. Exponential growth depends on your ability to develop other people into effective leaders. Identify the next leaders you're going to groom for more responsibility. Raise your standards always. Being around strong CEOs who are always raising their standards can be uncomfortable. They project a feeling that no matter how hard you are working, it's not enough. People may say, every time I get somewhere, you move the marker. When are you going to be fully happy? That's what makes a strong CEO so effective. That's why Jobs may have been loathed when he was imposing deadlines, but he's now revered. Four ways to accelerate your business. Number one, functioning speed. This is a support system you provide to your team. Examine who the people are and their capabilities. Can you help them improve through training and other means so they might cut some time from a function? Number two, processing speed. There are a number of functions or processes that make your organization go. How quickly do you get your product from A to Z? Number three, expansion speed. This is about how quickly you move into new markets, make acquisitions, and introduce new products. Number four, timing speed. The question when can work magic. Time your moves correctly, and you can beat competitors who have more resources than you do. Creating your business systems. If you're not that ambitious, maybe this approach is fine. But if you want to build something big and sustainable, you also have to rely on systems. Patrick is a big believer in systems. Systems of data, systems of procedures, systems of processes. Systems help you with follow through and follow up. And they also help create a culture in which nothing is ever unclear. You have to make lists. You must create manuals. Video libraries may be more effective than printed ones. You must codify your knowledge. You must codify your knowledge. If it exists only in your head, you have a job to do. If you want to have a sustainable business, codify what you know and make sure it gets transferred to everyone else in your organization. Manage with quantitative data. Bad managers use quantitative data. They'll analyze such a situation with words rather than numbers. They'll say the person is lazy, dishonest, or unmotivated. Those words don't do anything to solve the problem. Data, on the other hand, points to solutions. By relying on the data, you diffuse the emotion from the situation. By focusing on the numbers, you help the other person acknowledge realities. This not only provides the impetus for improvement, but preserves the relationship. Leadership. Lead with questions. 
I believe what sets me apart as a leader is my desire to really understand people. I do so by asking the right questions and holding people accountable to their own answers. The way I apply pressure is by asking questions and waiting for the answers. I challenge my people the same way I'm challenging you. I ask them to become clear on who they want to be and describe their next moves in detail. Once they express what they want, I use their answers to keep them accountable. I don't yell and scream. I don't impose my own goals on them. What I do is repeat what they said they want to accomplish. If they are falling short of their goals, I ask why and shut up. I've found that getting them to self-relate is much more powerful than telling them what to do. It all boils down to the willingness to ask questions, not just the expected ones such as how do you like your last job, but the ones that poke and probe and encourage people to reveal a deeper part of themselves. You've got to ask dig deep questions that help you discover who a person really is. You can't change people. They have to possess their inner drive to fix their own mistakes. Once you realize that, you can begin to manage people more effectively. Stop trying to solve other people's problems. Instead, realize that what people want is someone to listen to them, someone to ask them questions, someone to nudge them in the right direction. 10 questions to ask before raising money. Number one, should you even raise money? Number two, if you were not able to raise money, how would you make your business idea work? If you can answer this question, angels and VCs will be more interested in your business. By demonstrating that you don't need capital and gaining momentum before you try to raise money, you'll become a more attractive investment. Number three, how will the money you raise be used? When raising money, you need to put yourself into investors' shoes. Investors want to know how you will use the money. Number four, what does an ideal investor in your business look like? Is it somebody who's involved? You need to think about not only who a prospective investor is as a person, but also what type of relationship you want with him or her. Number five, do you want to keep total control of the business? Whenever you ask for money, it comes with a lot of expectations. People don't write checks without making demands. Number six, do you want accountability? Most entrepreneurs don't like other people telling them what to do, but venture capitalists want to do just that. They want to work with nimble entrepreneurs who are open to suggestions about their business. Number seven, have you done enough research about your industry? Don't waste investors' time by failing to do your homework. Number eight, what makes your business model different? Investors need to understand why your business stands out. Your company needs to be positioned so that it will have a distinctive competitive advantage in the marketplace. Number nine, have you done the math? What is the value of your company? The moment you present bad math, investors are going to walk away. They're expecting you to have real projections and back up your valuation with sound numbers. Number 10, are you building to sell? Investors want to know if they will be able to sell their investment for a solid return in five to seven years. Do you have an exit strategy? Cultivate positive paranoia. Good generals are paranoid and they respond to that paranoia by creating one great strategy after another. If you can out-strategize your competition, you can protect yourself from things that will go wrong. Don't wing it. Savvy entrepreneurs also respect Murphy's Law. Before you launch a new product, make an investment, pull the trigger on an acquisition, or make any type of major move, ask yourself this question. What are the very worst events that might happen as a result of my action? When you prepare for a likely future, your competitors who have not done so will be rattled while you steal their market share. You'll handle trends and other changes calmly while other companies' leaders are flustered. Show me a losing gambler in a casino who is vowing to get even and I'll show you someone who is a few moves away from losing it all. Entrepreneurs need to be prepared for unexpected attention, flattery and other perks of becoming successful, especially if they're not accustomed to this type of attention. They need to be aware that if they buy their own hype, they'll screech to a halt. Before we get on with the last of the review, I just want to take a moment to say thank you for watching and listening to this summary. We've currently uploaded more than 600 free video, audio, and written book summaries at Best Book Bits. 
We love for you to become a fan of us at bestbookbits.com, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help keep this book bits financially alive by checking out our products and services out in the links below such as physical books, downloadable PDFs, subscribing to our email newsletter, consuming our courses, and joining our coaching programs. Thanks again for being a fan and on with the summary. Control your narrative. If you don't talk about what you believe in, what your views are, and who you are as an individual, the world is going to decide who you are. It's up to you to control the narrative and talk about what you're dealing with. If you don't, others will. The first rule of self-promotion is that you have to be shameless. What holds people back is the fear of being judged. Visionaries have gotten past that. You can't be afraid of judgment when promoting yourself. A major power move is turning off the noise. Once you start controlling your own narrative, you also need to reduce the time you spend paying attention to everybody else's noise. Do you think big thinkers are paying attention to celebrity gossip? If you're going to speak your story into existence, you better have the right story and emotions to back it up. And if you're going to broadcast it to the world, you better back up the talk by living it. That's how you control your life's narrative. Always create opportunity in your life. The person who really has the leverage is the person who needs to deal the least. Options give you the power. If you can walk away from a deal, you're in the best position to negotiate the best terms. If you must make a deal happen, you're going to be the mercy of someone else's power, and you're probably going to make a lousy deal. The question is how to put it into practice. The short answer is, whenever possible, cultivate multiple options. Instead of looking for that one dream home, the same idea applies to a car, an office building, and a key hire. Survey the market and find three options you would enjoy. And last, how to reach your potential. When the struggle is removed from life, when you didn't have to earn it, people start to feel entitled and take things for granted. It's one of the laws of human nature. The number one factor in reaching your potential is simple. It must matter to you. History books are filled with individuals who did impossible things simply because it mattered to them. And that's a wrap on the book summary of Your Next 5 Moves by Patrick Bet David. If you want this summary via PDF, pop your email in the link below and I'll send this straight to you. Now, if you want to become a contributor to Best Book Bits and become part of the community, help read books, create book summaries, and do audio recordings just like this, email me at info at bestbookbits.com or DM me on Instagram at bestbookbits. You can also join our free book club at on Facebook. And if you want me to do a book summary, DM me on Instagram at bestbookbits or email me at info at bestbookbits.com or comment below. Thanks for watching and listening. Hope you got something from this. Like, share, comment, share with your friends. Tell me what you think. Have a great day. Go out there and work on your next five moves. Take care. Bye-bye now.